Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to Horse Tooth Cinema. Today I'm going to be reviewing Mad God, which is a stop motion animation that came out this year and it's directed by Phil Tippett. Phil Tippett is mostly known as a visual effects artist actually, and so he's worked on films like Star Wars, Jurassic Park, uh, Indiana Jones, I think. Obviously some of the greatest films of their generation known specifically for their visual effects. Um, but it seems like he always kind of wanted to get into uh, you know, filmmaking himself, and he certainly had a passion project for a really long time that ended up becoming Mad God. Mad God is about a figure known as the Assassin who is descending into a dark pit full of monsters, titans, and cruelty. As he descends deeper, revelations about this world and its creator start to come to life. So I actually saw this film a while ago, um, it was about a month or so ago, I think. Um, and basically, you know, I had to leave for a trip the day after I saw it, so I've been putting off reviewing it ever since because I, it's not exactly fresh in my mind anymore, not nearly as much as it was when I first saw it. And um, I, I was nervous about that because I wanted to really do this thing justice. Um, and so I don't know if I'll be able to fully, but I'm, I'm gonna try. So I think when you go to see a movie uh, at the theater or at home or wherever, I kind of tend to think that your enjoyment of it is based as much on your experience watching it as it is on the film itself. It's about like the setting of the theater, who you're with, how you're feeling that day. As humans, we're not like, you know, perfectly replicatable objects who, you know, if we see the same movie, we're all gonna think the same thing. Uh, no, we're different people, and it's not just based off the fact that we're, you know, we have different thoughts, it's also based off different experiences that we might have in our viewing experience. And I have to say, I think that I saw Mad God in the best experience possible. I don't think that the way I saw it will be replicatable for any of you, most likely, uh, for, for most people in general. So basically how it went was my local art house theater did an outdoor screening of it for one night only. And as the film started, there was actually a storm, a lightning storm that was building kind of in my peripheral vision that just started to build and build as the film went on. And as I'll get into, this movie is kind of an acid trip of a film, but uh, the lightning flashes in my periphery really, really complemented that. And um, as this film is kind of about, uh, you know, the notion of a creator, or you know, as the title suggests, a mad god, uh, the you know this, this you know, background stuff of you know real weather just flashing in my face. Uh, was just fantastic. It was a perfect complement to this movie. And so just as the film ended, I shit you not, it just started like pouring rain all over us. Like it kind of waited a little bit until, it seemed like it waited until the film was over to do it. But yeah, we, we just, we had to walk out in the pouring rain, which was, which just seemed really, really fitting for this. So I, um, I don't think this experience is going to be replicatable for people. Um, but I just have to be honest that this, this contributed to my experience viewing this. And I hope when I see it again, it'll be, you know, as emotionally impactful. Because as I'll get into, it's not just the experience, it also is the movie itself, but I don't think I'll ever have a movie experience like this ever again. I'll be very surprised if Mad God is not my favorite film of the year by the end of 2022. No other film has inspired me, made me think, or just, you know, given me hope for the future of movies quite like this one. So as I mentioned, it's directed by uh, Phil Tippett, and it's a passion project that's actually 30 years in the making. It took them that long to come up with what the story is ultimately about, as well as physically, you know, uh, get learn all these stop motion techniques to, um, you know, finally build this up. So I think, you know, even if you don't like the film, I think you'll at least appreciate it for that level. Um, you know, I think just just knowing how long this took and how much work it took to put it together um, compared to even normal films, uh, which are, you know, them, themselves super hard to put together, uh, that alone it has to just be commended for it. But why I really love Mad God is actually due to the story and the substance and really just the time period it was released in. In an age where we're so obsessed with CGI-dominated films, it really is refreshing to see a grand scale stop motion animation like this. It really integrates animation, uh, you know, the world of uh, fantasy and reality really quite seamlessly. I think it's unfortunate that stop motion movies are uh, as rare as they are, and I don't quite understand why. I mean, yes, it's obviously, you know, this took 30 years to make, uh, and most stop motion animations are harder to put together than our, you know, standard computer animations. But I also think audiences have gotten very, you know, accustomed to safe, familiar, um, computer animation. We still have people like Henry Selleck, who did Nightmare Before Christmas and Coraline, and I think he's working on a project right now. 
Uh, and of course, uh, Guillermo del Toro, for example, is doing a, a remake of Pinocchio in that's a stop motion animation. Um, but really, it's it's kind of rare, I think. And for for me, it's it's one of the best forms of animation. Just how much life all of these figures have, and how real it obviously is, because you're looking at an object. You're not looking at an image that was rendered on a computer screen. Also, I just I just can't believe that a movie with this sort of you know texture and scale um, is as dark as it is. This is one of the darkest, most fucked up movies I've seen this year, uh, and I've, you know, seen quite a bit. And it's an animated film. I mean, it's a medium that's often thought to be for kids, but really, um, I think this proves that you can do a lot with it that's not just dark. I mean, there's a lot of dark animation, but this is this is really, really like midnight movie uh, material. And I also just love how abstract it is. I mean, there's uh, strong ideas that are communicated through this, you know, through, through this story, but, you know, I think any person who sees this might project their own ideas onto this. It's left up to inter interpretation as to what these ideas are exactly, um, and, and I really love that because I think too often, especially in animated films, I mean, we're just kind of spoon-fed um, what, the, what the message is, what this ultimately means, um, and it's just really refreshing to see something that, uh, that doesn't take that approach. But the ideas are really strong. So Phil Tippett, for example, you know, he said in interviews that he uh, he, he read as much literature as he could um, on what he thought was going to be his film that could potentially influence it. And that really comes through when you watch the movie. There's a ton of Dante in here, for sure. Uh, I mean, this character, the assassin, is essentially descending through the nine levels of hell in not a very formal way, but that's essentially what it is. It's very inspired by that. There's a lot of religious imagery. I think the film opens with a quote from Leviticus, which is just absolutely brutal, basically describing the nature of a really malevolent creator. So yeah, in addition to Dante and also some of the more troubling parts of the Bible, uh, there's also a lot of Freud in here, I think. There's a lot of just like really disgusting, like perverse imagery that um, sometimes maybe has a little bit of a sexual connotation, so in, in that way it definitely owes something to Freud. But I think in general you could also just interpret this movie as like an exploration of the unconscious mind, which to me has always been the more interesting aspect of Freud as opposed to like all the penis envy stuff. It's really just interesting, you know, the aspects of our mind that are unconscious, that we don't see. Um, and how that might manifest through our behavior, and I love when movies do that, but this is more just an exploration of that part of the mind without any contextualization in the real world. But that's just, you know, one way you could read it. You could read it in any number of ways. It could be an exploration of the persistence of life, despite how destructive the world around it is. The constant struggle between uh, the creator and the created, and the different expectations they have for each other. Modern society turned against itself. Or, like I mentioned, just an exploration of the unconscious mind. It doesn't matter. It's a movie that respects its audience enough to discern their own meaning out of it. But it also presents you with a wide range of tools to do it. It's not just like some, you know, modern art exhibit where you have just like a red canvas and it's like, oh, what do you project onto this? You know, it, it, it presents you with a huge wide array of a wide array of tools to come up with your own meaning. Very much in the mode of like, say the last 20 minutes of 2001, A Space Odyssey. That's kind of what you're dealing here, extended out to a runtime of about 80 minutes. I can see people complaining, and I, and I have seen people complaining, that there isn't much of a narrative to speak of. And while I can see where they're coming from, I do disagree with that. There is a fairly clear narrative about this assassin who is sent, um, for some reason, down into the this hellish world. Um, and all of the terrible things that happened to him. Uh, and then later you see sort of kind of the origins of why he was sent down and uh, as well as the, the surroundings that are, you know, above this really hellish landscape. I think the, way, the reason people are struggling with a lack of narrative is because there's no dialogue in the film. Uh, or basically no dialogue anyway. And dialogue obviously is a tool that we've become very accustomed to. Um, people can still watch silent movies, but the thing is silent movies still have dialogue for the most part. It's just, it's just written in uh, flashes up on the screen every once in a while. Uh, so yeah, and here the, you, do, you don't really have those tools that we've become used to. Um, so I could see that being a problem for people, but I think if you just sort of go into it with that's gonna just be how it is, and let's see what I can take away from this. I, I do think you'll probably get something out of this. The plot of it, you know, it's not standard or anything, but there definitely is a narrative. Um, but I think 
to complain that this plot isn't, you know, fairly standard like a normal film, that would kind of be complaining, like, it'd be like watching Eraserhead <laughs> and complaining that, wow, that just, that just really wasn't a very standard movie. It was kind of weird. Basically what I'm saying is if you get to the end of the year without seeing Mad God, you're missing, you know, what's essentially a, a new take on 2001, or it's a passion project that, you know, is at the same level as something like Alejandro Jodorowsky's Dune. Like, it's it's a really special film, and I don't think that it's quite getting the recognition that it deserves in the, you know, film criticism, film community. Um, and I, I just think that's unfortunate, and I want to, you know, give it a shout out and really promote it. Uh, I urge everyone to go see it if they can. It's streaming on Shudder right now, and I think it's in some theaters. But this movie gets five stars from me. I fucking loved it. Anyway, that's gonna do it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, if you liked the video, you can like it down below and subscribe to the channel if you want. I've got more content coming out soon, and I'll see you guys in the next one. See ya.